All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining this, uh, this session on boardroom level uh, cybersecurity. My name is Sean Duker. I'm the uh, Regional Chief Security Officer at Palo Alto Networks in Asia Pacific. Uh, I'll get my, uh, my fellow panelists to uh, introduce themselves. So, John? John Davis, I'm the uh, Federal Chief Security Officer for Palo Alto Networks. Erin Neely Cox, I'm the Executive Managing Director at Strauss Friedberg, and I run our incident response practice globally. I'm Dick Clark from Good Harbor Consulting. I consult for boards on cybersecurity, and I'm also on four corporate boards. Awesome. All right, well, uh, I guess firstly, it, there's no surprise that over the past couple of years that uh, cybersecurity has now reached the point of being a board, boardroom level uh, discussion point. It definitely makes the life of a CISO uh, quite important, quite relevant, and also probably an extra responsibilities are actually out there. But I guess one of the biggest challenges that I uh, probably would always love to know, and obviously for everyone else in the room here that's either a CISO today or even a budding CISO, you know, how do you actually communicate to the board? What are some things that, uh, that you've actually seen work quite well? Dick? Well, I, I think boards are looking at cybersecurity because they have to. You know, they're not interested in spending more money. Uh, and if they, if they are going to spend more money, they kind of want to know what am I getting out of this? Uh, and what I hear all too often in board meetings is, all right, if I give you this additional program, uh, which costs all this additional money beyond the budget we gave you, uh, are you going to guarantee that the network's going to be secure? <laughs> and of course, you know, that's, that's a stupid dialogue. You can never have that guarantee. Um, but what I think boards would like to hear is, how am I doing compared to other guys? Mm. Yeah. Are we spending more or are we spending less? Uh, are we, is there some metric I can use to tell whether I'm in, in good shape or not? And, and the couple of things I suggest are, number one, what percentage of your IT budget are you spending on IT security? And how does that compare to other companies in your sector? You know, normally if you're doing 5%, that probably is on average. If you're doing less than 5%, you're probably in trouble. If you're doing 10%, that means you got hacked last year and you got budget. <laughs> uh, and you know, there's a definitional issue here about what's IT security versus IT, right. but that's one metric. Uh, another metric is you, know, you can go to companies like BitSight uh, and, and they will give you a score, an external score. They'll look at your uh, network externally and give you a score on a one to 800 uh, measure compared to other companies in your sector. Boards like that, uh, it's no guarantee uh, if you have a high score. It tends to correlate with good cyber hygiene. Uh, the other thing I suggest is that you do something like the NIST cyber standard, uh, which is a matrix of, I think, 20 boxes. Uh, and you can say to the board, where would you like to be as a company? Uh, what's our risk tolerance uh, and what kind of company do you want to be against the NIST standard? And that's at a 50,000 foot level, but it's something that they can understand. It gives them the feeling like they're participating in the decision. Uh, and it may actually start the dialogue that you want, which is, you, the board, need to tell me, the CISO, what your risk tolerance is. And I will design around your risk tolerance. Here's a risk register of maybe 10, maybe 20 cyber risks. What's your risk tolerance on that? High, low, medium? You tell me because I'm just working for you. I'm just the CISO. You know, I can't make decisions about what risk the company is going to be willing to accept. You, the board, can do that. And I need you to tell me. And you know, sort of force the board to tell you what their risk tolerance is in a way that you can then implement. And the, the NIST standard is one way to do that. Excellent. So Erin, I guess from your perspective, dealing with a lot of breaches or organizations that have been breached in the past, what, what have you seen, I guess, what dynamic has actually changed in the board? Um, yes, so that's a great question because my experience initially with boards was always during the middle of a crisis. So the entity has been breached, it's raised to the board level. I've reported to boards on findings. Some boards, 
you know, are they want once a week report. Some boards want the three times daily update calls. It depends on the board, right? Yeah. Um, and now I've certainly seen that shift to boards, companies that haven't been breached, their boards really wanting, you know, very much information about how protected they are. The exact question which you said, which are we good? I get, I've seen that a lot. Um, and it's an unfair question. Yeah. Uh, and so part of my job as an outside advisor to boards is really explaining to the board, diplomatically of course, that that's not a question to put to your CISO or your CIO, whoever's handling your cybersecurity posture. It's not a yes, no question, right? The question is really more about what's the, what's the framework that the board is using to assess their risk tolerance. And once you start engaging in that discussion, it becomes a much more familiar discussion to them because you know, after all, boards are used to talking about risks. They're used to talking about financial risk. Um, and there's no way a CFO goes before a board and says we have zero financial risk. It doesn't happen and they're not even expected to. Yep. So they need to have start having the same kind of risk-based discussions that they're having that, with their CISO that they're having with their other C-level stakeholders. Awesome. Okay. So John, question for you. I guess uh, from an interesting background that you've got working uh, in the military, what, what have you actually found in terms of a good way to, to communicate, especially when you think about security challenges that are out there it's not technology. And I think a lot of the CISOs over the years have probably come up through the technical ranks. What have you found as a very easy way, or sort of a layman's terms, to sort of explain to uh, people about the risks that are out there? Sure. Uh, it's, it's not much different than, uh, than what has already been explained. But uh, in my background, I spent the last 10 years of my 35-year military career in the cyber realm in organizations like, uh, like U.S. Cyber Command. And I found myself in a position as the director of, uh, of current operations, surrounded by a lot of very technical information that was coming at me. And I found one of the key attributes that I needed to develop in myself so that I could communicate with senior leadership was the ability to translate a lot of very technical information into meaningful language that senior leaders who may not be so technically inclined can understand. So when, you know, I can remember cases when the information coming to me would sound a lot like this. There was an SQL injection that pe penetrated our network interface and established command and control to a known bad URL associated with scarlet pajama. All right. <laughs> I, I knew what that meant, but there's no way I could, you know, that type of language is not going to work mm. in communicating up to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff or a combatant commander. You have to basically say, the Iranian I, you know, uh, IRGC has penetrated our network and put the following uh, X, Y, and Z missions at, at risk. Uh, th those type of, you know, that type of language, they do understand. And it's about standard risk, uh, risk calculation, risk decision making. I think that uh, it's no different in the, in the commercial sector and that you need to essentially talk in terms of operational impact to the bottom line, whatever the bottom line is. Mm. We even got away from, uh, in terminology in DOD, we got away from calling things uh, information assurance and changed it to mission assurance because it, it was about the mission. It was about what was happening in the cyber domain and the impact that it would have on our ability to do our mission. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, I guess probably a bit of a, an open question and hence the reason I guess why uh, Palo Alto Networks partnered with the New York Stock Exchange around really educating boards and understanding what the cyber challenges are out there. And I think I'll pose the question to yourself, Aaron, but one of your chapters in the book was around going through a blueprint. Mm -hmm. And if you could sort of explain, I guess, what, what does that blueprint look like for cyber security risks? So it's essentially, it's essentially giving uh, boards a discussion framework, right? Instead of just asking the yes, no questions, it's, say, it's providing them with questions that they can ask that then management can report up to them and it's at the appropriate level. I think what we've seen also is we've either seen boards that are not involved enough or boards that are way too involved. Um, they're asking questions of their IT security departments that they wouldn't ask in other realms. You know, the board doesn't need to know how their firewalls are configured, right? They just need to know they have firewalls. Yep. Um, and so, um, so it's essentially boiling down into three areas where the board can then drill down even further. So has the organization properly assessed its risk, right? Have they looked at the risk picture for the enterprise and put cybersecurity in the appropriate place, much like what you were saying, and have those risks been prioritized, right? Not all risk is alike. You know, the risk that you have for certain data 
is very unlike the risk for other data and to treat all data the same is probably a mistake. And then what actions, what are the actions that management is taking to reduce that risk? So if you really sort of, everything can fit within those three sort of categories and you can then have a higher level discussion about what you're doing to put yourself in the best risk posture yep. as opposed to getting too into the details. Right? Okay, good point. So Dick, I'll pose a question to you around, I guess the level of understanding and awareness at the board. Uh, if obviously you said that you were on a couple of boards as well. What's a good way to educate the board? And I think if I look at, um, a lot of the discussions that I've had with board of directors over the years, it's they'll go to a party, they'll see, the, they'll read the news, they'll see what's happening around, and they'll, they'll want to get under. I guess they want to learn what's actually happening out there. What have you found as a good way to do that? So I think from the CISO perspective, uh, you need to find the member of the board who will be your friend, uh, and and that is hopefully a member of the board who's somewhat literate, uh, technically. Uh, most of the board is never going to get it, uh, and it's terrible when a breach occurs and the board is involved. I've been there. That's ugly. Um, it's better if the board designates in advance one board member who's going to be the interface when a breach occurs. Uh, and you, the CISO, can get to know that person in advance and educate that person. And among the messages you need to get across, I think, are we're going to have a breach. Uh, no matter how good I am as a CISO, no matter how much money you give me, uh, they're going to get in. Look at all the places they got in. They got into you know, the Pentagon. They got into the White House. They got into you know, the best companies in America. They will get in. Don't panic when that happens because I, the CISO, have developed a, a breach plan uh, and we can deal with it when it happens. So I, I think you need that breach plan, but you need the breach plan to be more than what you do. You need the breach plan to have the lawyers involved and make sure they're not just general corporate lawyers, but they're lawyers who specialize in breach. Uh, you not, need to have the PR firm involved that specializes in breach. Uh, you need to have a whole of company, whole of corporation approach to being ready for that breach because it will happen and actually show that to the board member. And maybe that board member says, I want to bring this to the whole board. Uh, and maybe you hold a tabletop exercise with the C-level people uh, so that the C-level people don't freak out when the breach occurs because they've played a game where they've done it and they've played their own role in that game. Uh, you, know, you know from the military in general how important that is, that you don't want your first war to be a real one. Uh, well, you don't want your first breach to be a real one either. Uh, so I think finding that one board member, uh, if the board won't designate that person, uh, then you should kind of look at their backgrounds and you working with the corporate secretary or the in-house general counsel, figure out who that person is on the board that's going to simultaneously be your oversight, but also your advocate. And also that, per, that one board member who will be bothering you uh, during the breach. Excellent. So John, I guess from your perspective, obviously you go through a lot of um, training exercises, a lot of scenarios. What, what have you actually seen work quite well when you sort of go through that, that mock exercise of there's a breach or something's actually happened. What, what have you seen sort of work quite well? Yeah, I would just reinforce what Dick said in terms of a whole of whatever organization, whole of corporate uh, approach to things. There, I believe that it's, it's uh, at least in my experience, it's very important to treat this as something that is integrated. It's not isolated, it's not a technical thing. It has, in cyber, the cyber domain really connects a bunch of different functions together, and in today's digital age, it is increasingly connected. So it is not an isolated thing, and the more you can put things in terms of, the, in speaking the, the language as an integrated language, operational impact for something like the military, yep. or how it impacts the bottom line, and, and traditional risk, not something separate risk, 
I think is important, as well as an integrated uh, response function that, that needs to be uh, practiced and rehearsed. Uh, Palo Alto Networks recently participated in a major uh, U.S. government-sponsored exercise that included the public and the private sector. We went through that. It was, a, it was a, one of those scenarios where it was uh, Sophie's choice. At the, at, based on what happened in the scenario, you had to make some very serious decisions about your response to the particular exercise malware that was used in the scenario. And no matter which way you went, there was going to be uh, technical impact, operational impact, legal and liability considerations, and how are you going to communicate this to the public and your, and your client base? Mm -hmm. Well, at the conclusion of that exercise, we brought our C-suite in. Uh, ca they came in cold. We brought them into the, uh, the, uh, one of our conference rooms, and the exercise players, there were only a few players uh, that were involved, and we presented them with this information. And then they had to react to it. They had to make decisions and, and react to the specific scenario. And what we did as a result of that was we captured the, the key lessons and we updated our own crisis response playbook. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that uh, is very important for, for all organizations to do, uh, just, just as Dick mentioned. Yep. Yeah, and, and just to follow up on that, you know, if, if your CEO says, oh, I'm not going to play myself in this silly game, tell them, the President of the United States played himself in a cyber game. <laughs> who, who are you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I, I would also add that one thing that I insist upon at these tabletops or wargaming exercises is the realistic nature of the mm. scenario that you're yeah. dealing with. You know, a lot of people are doing these and it's just a, you know, off the shelf scenario. There's not a lot of thought to it. And I think one thing that is going to be important is to really put your um, staff through the paces of a very realistic scenario to your particular company right, and the higher risks and threats to your sector. You know, not everyone, you, you don't need to be um, operating at Lockheed speed when you're a retailer, right? And the other thing is giving them information, just like John said, and requiring decisions, because that's exactly how it happens, right? You have a certain amount of information on day one. That's all you have, yeah. and you have to make critical decisions, and you don't know what's going to happen. And then on day three, you have more information, some of which contradicts the information you had on day one. Now those decisions seem like, how do we make those decisions? And then on day 30, again, a, a more comprehensive, robust amount of information, but it doesn't happen like at the flip of a switch, right? It, investigations, breach response, it takes time, especially for the more complex ones. So you have to be willing to make these trade-offs and really requiring somebody to do that in advance, putting them in that uncomfortable position where there's no risk is, hugely valuable. Yep. And, and making them make decisions is important because right. how many of you know the, the reference to Kobayashi Maru? <laughs> Any Star Trek people here? <laughs> I, I think it's key that no matter what decision they make, they're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> because you have to, you, to, to really get them to get the most value uh, out of the exercise, they have to see what it will be like if things don't work. Uh, if there isn't a cybersecurity, adequate cybersecurity program. Have them sweat it out. Uh, one thing that we've done uh, with companies that are publicly traded is we have the stock price up on the board and we artificially drop it during the course of the exercise. And you see all these C-suite players realizing that their personal net worth is going through the floor. <laughs> you know, they need to come to grips with that. They need to see and feel and sweat uh, so that they see how bad it could be, then they're going to give you the checkbook. Mm -hmm. yep. Very good points. Uh, in terms of, I guess, the, the, the role of the board and how it's evolved over the years, if you sort of did that sort of crystal ball and tried to work out how the, bo the board will evolve over the next five years, Aaron, what do you actually see? What's, what's your points around that one as to how you think things will evolve? Well, one of my um, hopes is that uh, boards start treating cyber risks similar to the way they treat cyber uh, financial risk, right? They have audit committees for financial risk. Um, hopefully they'll have someone on the board that is technically savvy, can understand the language. They will either put cyber within its own risk committee or put it within the audit committee. We've seen that happen a lot because they're used to dealing with complex risk scenarios. And they'll really be talking about these issues uh, all the time. 
And having someone on the board that can be that you know ambassador for purposes of cyber risk um, is going to be really important. And then just putting it on the agenda. We have to know. We have to talk about it. We have to think about it. We have to go through the paces every meeting. Every committee meeting has to be reported up. Yep. Um, making it become part of the norm, I think, is going to be critically important. But, but if you can influence what committee it goes on, uh, I would say get it away from the audit committee. Uh, and some, some uh, organizations just put it there out of convenience, right? Because they don't want to create well, their own risk committee. But I, I agree with you, it's not necessarily the best place. You, know, you give it to the audit committee and you get a, a, a compliance mentality uh, and a checkbox mentality. Uh, and then they want you to be, you know, ISO certified, and then they think everything's fine. <laughs> um, I, I would, if you can influence it, yeah. uh, if there's an enterprise risk management committee, I'd put it there. Right. Or if you can, just get one or two board members to be a cyber committee, that's, that's fine too. That'd be great. Jake, how do you think things will evolve from obviously being on boards yourself? How do you see that sort of evolution taking place? Well, it's, it's interesting. You know, pendulums tend in this business to swing from one end to the other. Five years ago, I couldn't get a board to talk about it. Now it's every quarter, right? right? Every quarterly meeting, they have to get a cyber report. Um, where I'd like to see it drift to in the middle is the cyber risk committee of the board. Uh, we are seeing board members, uh, we are actually seeing people get recruited to boards and get appointed to boards because they have some cyber uh, understanding. Uh, that's why I'm on a couple of boards. I'm the cyber guy on the board. Um, so I, I think f for the near term, if we can see more cyber literate people appointed to boards, if we can set up cyber risk committees on boards, uh, and if we can get sort of a way of reporting to boards that gives them metrics, mm -hmm. and that the board can hire outside experts like us, you could hire either of us, um, to give the board some assurance that you're doing the right thing. That's where I think we want to be. Yep. yep. Go, Joe. I was, I was just going to add, I'm not very good at making predictions. I'll just caveat it that way. <laughs> but uh, I think that over time, I think that this educational uh, dynamic is going to uh, become more and more prevalent but in both directions. Uh, the IT and cybersecurity and technical communities are going to learn what matters to C-suites and boards and, and how to more effectively communicate in meaningful language to them. And at the same time, I used to never waste an opportunity when briefing senior leadership to educate them on the more technical aspects of, 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 uh, of the, the, the cyber realm. Because uh, I think you can get into trouble using analogies. Analogies are, are an easy way for technical folks to try to put, thing, uh, put things into the language that's understandable by senior leaders who may not be so technically inclined. But I have never seen a, an environment that is so distinct in terms of speed, scale, the, the complexity between physical, geographic, logical. It's, it's a very, you know, every analogy that you try to use will fall apart at some point. And so if you're using analogies, just be careful that you point out where they do fall apart or else you'll have senior leaders making bad decisions. But I think the education will, will go in, in both ways and, and we will be better at that. What I hope that results in is, and this is a hopeful prediction, uh, I've seen, it, it seems to me like the IT community and the security community are always at odds with one another. One is about performance, the other is about security, and it's always a win-lose. It's always a win-lose decision for uh, senior uh, management to uh, you know, make a trade-off between uh, performance and, and, and security. In today's world, I don't think that's true anymore. I think that they go together. And I, I would like to see uh, leadership in, in C-suites and boards become more involved in establishing the strategies that a company is going to use in order to bring those two towards yeah. a common objective. Bring the IT and the cybersecurity uh, community together, mm -hmm. make them work together towards a common objective that's in support of the, of the organization. And, and, and you get more of a win-win dynamic associated yeah. with that. Yeah, and to add to your point about education, I agree with you. I, my wish is that we can, through education, stop a lot of this fear-based talk that is out there. I mean, yep. we've all seen it. 
all these scary stats and talks about threat vectors and threat actors. And I mean, you could fill hours with um, yeah. talks that could just panic a crowd, right? I find that to be less, um, you know, less valuable. What we, what we need to do is we need more education, more awareness, more action, so that we can understand that we, are, we have the knowledge and with the knowledge we can act uh, in a more appropriate way, right? So hopefully over time, these discussions will be less fear-based and more reason-based in terms of the approach that we have to them. Yep. And I think as we've, as we've started to see, even the role of the CISO has started to change. Uh, we've started to see, I think there was some recent reports saying that there's a lot more people that are starting to think that the CISO needs to have an MBA, more of a business background to understand business risk, because it is a business risk at the end mm -hmm. of the day. I, I think the way you get at that is with the governance, the corporate governance structure. Mm. Uh, what we recommend always is the CISO can report to the CIO, okay, but she also needs a dotted line uh, to somebody else, uh, whether that's the in-house general counsel or the, the COO, uh, because I don't think any CEO wants to be in a situation, and I've seen this happen in the real world, where after the breach, the CIO so says, well, you know, this wouldn't have happened uh, if I had gotten the budget for that thing I asked for. Mm -hmm. And the CEO turns to her and says, I didn't know you asked for that. I didn't know you got turned down for that. The CEO doesn't want to be there. And the board doesn't want to be there. So there needs to be some rep dual reporting line for the CISO. And when there is a decision that we're going to defer something for two years, or we're not going to put something in the budget. The CEO, at least the CEO, needs to know that the decision has been made at a lower level uh, not to budget for that thing that the CISO has asked for. And because that is a decision about risk. Mm. And it's not the CIO's job to make that decision. Yeah, and my advice in that regard, actually, our advice is to have the CISO not report to the CIO. Right. There's a natural tension between the CIO's primary job, which is operational effectiveness, and the CISO's primary job, which is security. They yep. obviously have to work together. They have to collaborate. There has to be a great dynamic there. But if you take them out of the reporting line, these risk discussions come up more naturally and without the fear of, well, this is my direct report. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of CISOs report into other C-level executives, and that seems to alleviate some of that tension. Yeah. Either, either report in or have a dual That's reporting right. chain or have an enterprise risk management ERM committee of C-level people. That's right. Mm. I guess that's an interesting one, and it's one that's probably been discussed widely around, does the CISO report into the CFO, but if times are tough, does that start to sort of hamper any security programs that may actually sort of be kicked off? Uh, yeah, it shouldn't be the CFO. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. I think it's one of those big discussions that always tends to pop <laughs> up. Um, but the interesting part around that one is there's definitely a lot of reporting that's been taking place lately. I think it was a survey from Vericode last year that was saying 69% of our respondents believe that their boards aren't really that prepared for yeah. it. Uh, and there's obviously a lot of talk that the CISO needs to go through this process of mapping out a bit of a plan, a bit of a, a sort of a plan of attack. John, what have you actually seen sort of work well in terms of how do you get on that front foot? Uh, what can we do around sort of making sure that everyone's sort of along for the journey and we sort of uh, all work together? Uh, it's, it, is a, it is a difficult transition for an organization to go through. And I'll just, I'll use the military example. Um, I was at uh, an organization that no longer exists called Joint Task Force Global Network Operations in 2008 when we, I got a phone call from a buddy at, at the National Security Agency uh, telling me I needed to get to a secure phone. This is no longer classified. But, uh, get to a secure phone because we had an infection in our classified networks. And that was a, that was a slap in the face, a wake up call. I thought I was gonna be fired. But instead I found myself uh, living off of a cot in my office for the next three months, cleaning that up mm -hmm. and reporting daily to uh, the 
several combatant commanders and, and even, even the chairman. And as a result of that incident, we found that we needed to create U.S. Cyber Command. And so in the military example, this was, this was one of the reasons that we wanted to make, we wanted to kind of mainstream cyber in the military and make it a, an, a normal part of the chain of command. Create an organizational structure with the chain of command and accountability and the authority to issue orders and enforce actions and ensure follow-up and uh, uh, increase uh, standards and discipline throughout the military. So it was a, it was a, a, a way kind of uh, to, um, you know, talking about where should the CISO re reporting structure, where should it be? We made a dram dramatic change in the military and essentially made a made it a normal command function and it's still maturing today and I, there's recent discussions about whether or not cyber command is even going to be elevated to a full combatant command itself i think it will eventually yeah. but um i think it's, it's been on that path since its inception but um, um i think it's a way to to try to uh elevate the role of the CISO and the military and uh and make it more a more normal function associated with the organizational structure well, I guess I'll just sort of segue now and ask if there's any questions out from the audience. Yes. Just a microphone. What is the role of the CISO, or is there some other person or organization that can advise the organization on building security into training apart from cyber uh, products? So uh, I, I think w one thing you've got to do is, is make sure your, the, your company is using the SDLC uh, development process and sort of extend from the SDLC into all new products have to have a security component in the development cycle, not just the software, but all new products. Uh, and M&A, and getting back to the board's role, uh, all M&A decisions have to have a cyber component to them. Uh, and the, for, for the boards, when they're looking at M&A uh, opportunities, that has to be part of the diligence. Um, so I, I've been brought in after, com after boards have decided to buy companies, uh, after they've made the decision and, the, and the, the company's been bought, I get brought in and uh, go look at our new division that we just bought and see how much money it's going to cost to get it secure up to our standards. Well, that's the wrong point in time, guys. You, know? <laughs> you, should, have, you should have made that part of the decision in the first place uh, because it changes how much money you're going to have to spend on that new division. Uh, the same is true of product development. Uh, there has to be a point in product development where the cybersecurity implications of that product are evaluated by someone other than the product development team. Uh, uh, or else, you're going to pay them later. It's, you know, pay me now or pay me later. You have to build it into the cycle. And that, that again, is something that the CISO can be the advocate for, but it's not the CISO's job to do it. Yes. Just got a microphone there. Hello? OK, this is James. I'm a CISO for a company. And a company we manufacture medical devices, right? So just like a Palado, right? You have internal security, a traditional CISO position, but also you sell firewalls, right? So who is responsible for security on your product? You sell to the customer. You're responsible or somebody else responsible for a product on the consumer side? <laughs> well, I, yeah, I was going to say, it, that's not the CISO's responsibility at, at Palo Alto Network. He, yes. It is very much an internal network, you know, making sure our own networks are, 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 are secure. 
but the product development and the, the uh, engineering teams, they all, they all have a role in quality assurance with regard to the to, uh, product. So research, development, engineering, all of that, I believe, takes place, and that's where the responsibility lies. And I guess to Dick's point as well, obviously we go through a secure software uh, design life cycle as well. We go through rigorous product testing constantly, and that's done through the engineering teams themselves. But then if you think about it from, I guess, a risk perspective, uh, you know, if, if I was to ask Mark McLaughlin what he's, you know, what keeps him up at night, he pretty much has got a, a very clear answer. Uh, you know, fear of obviously our products failing for a customer, and obviously for us being breached as well. So he's kind of looking at it from both angles because ultimately it's it's our risk, it's our reputation that's on the line. But you know, the CISO doesn't have the responsibility for making the the product secure. Yeah. But the CISO can be the advocate to make sure that the product development process has a cybersecurity component built into it and someone, not the CISO, someone who has to check the box in the product development life cycle at a couple of points in the life cycle that cybersecurity has been adequately addressed. Okay, so if we maybe a follow-up question. Like Paul Otto, right? For example, your product people is going to open a website, Amazon EC2, have a portal for customer to log in, right? Mm -hmm. And nothing to do with internal application. So how do you make sure that portal is secure? You know, we find the R&D people, the product people can't go anywhere right now very easily on the cloud to open up an application for product support, for example. Yep. That's really nothing to do with me. I don't even have idea they open up a web portal to do something. So you're saying the event of uh, one of the internal teams yes. sort of decides to go off and do that? that? That's a challenge that I see in many organizations. So I work with a lot of organizations that are dealing with that challenge all the time. Uh, one of the core tenets that I just think you need to have is visibility. If you can't see that some internal team is opening up an instance on EC2 or they're going out and setting this one up, or data is actually leaving your organization potentially going out there, you're missing that gap. And if you can't see it, you're not going to be able to control it. Uh, so that definitely needs to be part of a security program. Uh, we need to be thinking about the way that businesses are transacting these days, they're moving these days, everything is dynamic. They're working agile environments. Uh, I've, I've seen a lot of instances where marketing department will say, I don't like our CRM, we're just going to go off to salesforce.com. That's great. All customer information goes up there. So how do you start to put some sort of assurance and governance around what is going up there? That, that definitely does fall on the responsibility of the CISO. Yeah, the, the, the CISO definitely yeah. has to have, very yeah. clearly, from the CEO, the authority to say, nothing goes on on this network. There's no, there's no private network stuff. Yeah. There's no going out and, and going to AWS or Salesforce or anything without the CISO approval. I think as Aaron said before, it's, it's an interesting point where, or the interesting dynamic where kind of the CIO is thinking about, well, this is what you know, we want to do as a new you know, go-to-market strategy or the CTO is saying this is how we want to sort of technically do something new in, in our business. They, the CISO should actually be working and, and maybe sometimes be at loggerheads to work out, not to say no, but, but there is another way that we can do this securely or maybe we can do it this way. Yeah, that, that's the conversation that we need to be thinking about more around you know, not being the no or the blocker because as we've seen in the past, people will just go around all that. The motto needs to be safely enabling. Yeah, and if there's not, I mean, if, you know, if there's not a secure way to do it, then there has to be a discussion about whether or not you want to accept that risk. I mean, certainly there are business objectives that we make as a company that we're going to go down this road because technology is evolving and we're going to, we want to stay on the tip of the sphere and we're going to go down there. But we have to have an informed discussion about risks. If we're surprised by risk because we, something happens that we didn't anticipate, that's when I think things to go off the track. So make, make, make that decision explicitly. Exactly. And exactly. oh, by the way, have a paper trail. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> any other questions? Yes, at the back. Um, do you have any advice or tips for folks who are in the technical roles, right? The, uh, the engineers and the analysts who are trying to kind of drive a change in security culture in a company. How do you make, how do you educate? How do you make senior level leadership aware of the need for security when you're way down there in the weeds? I get hired a lot to do that. And there are lots of people like me you can hire. Um, I think bringing in an outside 
set of eyes and an outside expert to educate the sea level uh, is a really good idea uh, and to validate your needs. Now, you know, they, they're going to know that you hire them <laughs> and naturally they're going to validate your needs. But they're also, if you get the right consulting uh, organization, they're going to be able to explain it to the, the C-level people, uh, the CEO, the CFO, in language they understand. Uh, so there is, you know, we talk about cyber education and awareness for the staff, you know, and, and spear phishing education and all of that. But just as much, we need cyber education for the CEO and the CFO uh, and, and other in-house people like the in-house general counsel. Sometimes if you uh, can't find a consulting firm that can do that, sometimes your law firm can do that. Uh, the big national law firms and international law firms usually have a partner who specializes. Uh, and that, that partner can frequently be that person who comes in and does the cyber education. Yeah, because it's a matter of enterprise risk. What I've seen happen is uh, all, obviously hiring outside consultants to give the advice, but going to your C-level stakeholders and, and asking them to hire an independent to look at what you've determined is your risk right. and give them advice. So you're not actually picking the person. They go through the process of picking the person, vetting the person they're going to trust. Then the person assesses the situation independently from you, so they're not yep. rubber stamping your recommendations. They may well differ, but uh, you know, most of the time they come out uh, aligned in many areas. And then there's an independent expert reporting to the board on what your actual risk is and what the benchmarking is and exactly. how, how that's weighing out. And then you have that voice. I mean, it's like my kids. Like I can tell my kids something 20 times, and if one of their teachers or friends tells them, suddenly it's, you know, it's what should be happening. You know? It's <laughs> yeah. like nothing like a third party. And, to and, get something done. And, and, uh, and that, you're exactly right. And the way I would suggest you might think about doing that is going to the in-house general counsel uh, and saying to that in-house exactly. general counsel, you hire this person through our law firm because the law firm has privilege and therefore if, the, if that consultant comes in through the law firm, their report is, is privileged. Right. Uh, and therefore if there's a shareholder suit later on, uh, it's not going to be discoverable. That's very important. And I know it sounds technical and, and legalistic, and I'm not a lawyer, but if you're a publicly traded company, you are likely uh, going to get a shareholder suit after a breach. And you don't want a report laying around from a consultant that said you should do X that the, they can get in the lawsuit and say, oh, look, you had an outside consultant tell you you should do X and you didn't do that. So everybody knows that at the sea level. They don't want to get exposed like that. The way around it is have the in-house general counsel get the law firm, get the law firm to hire the consultant. That's right. I mean, and even in the breach situation, that's, there's ways to articulate an enterprise risk and liability as a result from a proactive. One of my first questions when we get called to respond to a breach, and we typically get called by CIO or CISO, right? They're seeing the anomalous behavior. We're working with them. Is, you know, where's your general counsel on this? And he's typically the one to involve outside counsel. We make sure that everyone approaches it as a liability event for the company, potential liability event, um, so that it can be, the company can be properly protected and defended. Um, and that's just an important question in this climate because I am a former lawyer and there are a lot of people that come after companies that have been victimized by cybercrime. Uh, it's not just shareholder, you know, shareholder derivative suits, it's consumer class actions, it's F FTC inquiry, it's SEC inquiry. I mean, that's just the, you know, that's just what's happening for some of these higher profile uh, breaches. So it's best to get legal and technical working together to protect the company. Here, here, here's a fun way to, to initiate that conversation. Go to your in-house general counsel and say, does the law firm that we have doing most of our work really have expertise in mm -hmm. cyber? And how do you know that? that? That opens the dialogue. Going back to an earlier point uh, about rehearsing and practicing these things and maybe an exercise format, just like to add that uh, a lot of great learning goes on in those kinds of uh, scenarios. And like Dick said earlier, this is where you can put the worst case scenario in front of them and, and, and it, w that little 
you know, cost other than time, and which is often the biggest challenge with, with educating some of the very senior leaders. But if you can manage to do that and get them to go through a worst case scenario in order to practice or rehearse a, you know, what are your contingency plans, your crisis response plans, you will find that a tremendous amount of education occurs in those type of forums. Yeah, awesome. Any final questions? So John, I guess sort of in wrapping up now, what's uh, two takeaway tips that everyone here could sort of take away and, uh, and hopefully implement in the, inside their own organization or think a little bit differently about doing inside their own organization? I would say the, the, the big themes ought to be uh, to take an, a more integrated approach and not try to make this uh, an isolated issue. Make it more mainstream and more integrated. And the other uh, big takeaway is the language translation thing. And that's just, uh, that's going to be solved through, over time, through an educational process that has to go both ways so that you can speak in meaning, meaningful terms to b both the technical community and the leadership community. I would say inclusive board level um, action, so making sure you have technically savvy people on your board, that you've engaged in discussions, that there's a great information flow going on there, and just trying to turn that paradigm into a more proactive cyber risk management, one that is informed based on what your company is really going through as opposed to theoretical threats, um, so that you can act and better protect your company. Awesome. Dick? Find that one board member who's going to be your friend. Educate him. Awesome. Everyone, thank you very much. My panelists, thank you very much. John, Aaron, Dick, appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you.